Hi, my name is Benjamin Fulker, and I'm going to talk about classifiers and features today that are suitable for appliance classification on resource-constrained hardware. This is joint work with my colleagues Philip Scholl and Bernd Becker. If we look at the global electricity consumption, we can see that it averages to around 3,350 kilowatt hours per capita. And by looking at the trend over the last years, for example in Portugal, we can already see that the demand has constantly risen over the last decades. We can also see that there are some demographic differences in the consumption amount. For example, in the US, we have a massive 12,000 kilowatt hours per capita, but we see the same trend of a rise in electricity consumption. This is actually a bad thing, considering that the production of electricity is a large contributor to the emission of greenhouse gases. So what can we do to reduce the electricity consumption? We, of course, could buy new appliances with a lower energy consumption, but replacing existing and working appliances may not be sustainable at all. We could also adapt the usage patterns of the appliances. So use them if clean energy by solar cells or wind turbines are available. We could also reduce the standby consumption by turning them off completely. And we could make it a game. So for example, challenge our neighbors on who reduces less energy in the next week. But all that requires, or at least benefits, on that we know the exact consumption of each appliance in our home. This is called appliance level consumption feedback. Such feedback cannot be provided using existing infrastructure. However, it can be retrofitted in two ways. One way is called intrusive load monitoring. This requires to install a dedicated electricity meter to each and every appliance of interest. This is of course a little cumbersome to install and also to maintain. And also for some appliances like the stove, not feasible for non-electricians. The second method is called non-intrusive load monitoring. This requires only a single electricity meter installed at the central position in the home's electric network. And this device might also be an existing smart meter already installed in the fuse box. The aggregated data of this meter is then analyzed and the individual consumption of the appliance is disaggregated using some advanced algorithms. This is of course less intrusive and may not even require to install any new hardware if a smart meter is already installed. However, running these algorithms directly on the smart meter remains challenging. Besides the fact that you typically cannot install any software on these as they are locked for temper detection, they also typically use resource-constrained hardware, simply not being capable of running anything than lightweight algorithms. However, typical NILM algorithms are not lightweight at all. You may then argue that the data can be processed at external entities, like by sending the data to cloud services. But that poses security risks to the homeowner, because an attacker could easily use this data to determine if you are at home or not. So today we want to take a look at lightweight NILM algorithms that might be directly integratable into smart meter hardware. There are basically two types of NILM algorithms. One are event-less algorithms that have a dedicated model for each appliance of interest. These models can be seen as a black box and directly convert the input data to a consumption profile for the particular appliance. Typical models are artificial neural networks or hidden Markov models, which are far from being computational inexpensive, of course. That's why they are typically only applied on a larger window of data rather than for each new data point. Such windows may be up to a day of data sampled typically at 1 or 1 over 60 Hz. In contrast, event-based algorithms divide the disaggregation step into three sub-steps. At first, an event is extracted from the continuous data. Second, the event is classified, basically meaning that the appliance causing the event is identified. And third, a list of events is then used to reconstruct the load profile for each appliance. And as the classification and reconstruction is only applied to events, these are applied to much higher resolution data from typically 1 to 16 kHz. We did a little research here and looked at the number of events in typical electrical data sets, and these actually sum up to only 275 events per day. 
Therefore, event-based algorithms require less computation than event-less algorithms and should be off choice for resource-constrained hardware. Let's now look deeper into that. The event detection and load reconstruction step are typically lightweight. The bottleneck here is actually the classification part. The number of computations, of course, depends on the specific classification algorithm which is used, but also on the input to that algorithm, meaning the features. In our work, we wanted to answer these three questions here. What are the best standalone features for appliance classification? What is the best feature combination for appliance classification? And obviously, what is the best classifier? And all that by keeping in mind that the algorithms should be executed on resource-constrained hardware. So let's start by um, listing the classifiers and features we actually considered. For the classifiers, these are k-nearest neighbors, support vector machines, random forest, and as they did fairly well in recent uh, machine learning competitions, uh, gradient boosting trees, meaning XGBoost in particular. For the features, we did a little literature review and selected 27 features, which have been used by other researchers in the domain, specifically for the task of appliance classification. 21 of them can be extracted directly from the time domain, while six uh, can be extracted from the spectral domain. They range from scalar features up to features that actually have 40 dimension um, with an overall dimension for all features of 128. Each used feature is listed on this slide here. We can see that it includes classical features such as active, reactive and apparent power or phase angle between voltage and current, but also features which stem from feature engineering, such as the VI trajectory or the harmonic energy distribution. If we, for example, look at the PQ plane here, so active and reactive powers on the axis, we can clearly see clusters in the data, which is actually a good thing, as this allows our classifiers to easily distinct these two classes here. If we look at other points, for example, for more low power appliances here, we can see that these clusters tend to overlap which make it not so easy to discern them. That's when adding another feature will come in handy. For example, if we now use um, the voltage and current trajectory, and if we e.g. have these two appliances here, the fridge and the hi-fi system, which might both consume around 100 watt, so they overlap in the PQ plane, um, it might have totally different current waveforms with respect to their voltage waveforms, which is actually what the VI trajectory projects onto this 2D plane here. This allows us again to easily discern these two classes. We used four publicly available datasets for our experiment. Whited, Plat, Fired and Blonde. While Whited and Plat are laboratory measurements of appliance startup events, Fired and Blonde are long-term measurements of an apartment and an office building respectively. So the input data to our feature extraction engine looks like this. With 1.5 seconds of voltage and current data from a particular labeled events. The events happen at exactly 0.5 seconds for each of the event. While whited and bled directly contain such startup events here, they need to be extracted from the continuous measurements of fired and blonde. We did so by using a simple threshold based event detector that has been introduced by Weiss et al. It uses the parent power signal and filters these using the combination of a mean and median filter. After that, the derivative is taken and all deltas with less than 3 watt are forced to zero. Positive values are then treated as startup events and negative values as shutdown events. We further restricted that consecutive events need to be further apart than 3 seconds. In total, we extracted over 16,600 startup events from more than 350 individual appliances. We used these and split them into 80% training and 20% test samples. On all training samples, grid search and 5-fold cross-validation was applied to choose the best hyperparameter for each classifier based on the parameters listed here and the F1 score metric. The final score for a particular instance is then obtained from the F1 score on the test set. Let's take a look at the results and answer the three questions we had before. Number one, what are the best standalone features? To answer this, we evaluated each of the 27 features individually for each dataset and for each classifier. 
The results are summarized in this massive table here. I would like to draw your attention on the marked features. While some of them alone show a high of one score of up to 88%, they typically come with the drawback of a high dimensionality, like the waveform approximation, for instance. In contrast, the best performing scale feature is the active power, which only comes to an F1 score of around 54%. We, however, can also see that the tri stimulus with a rather small dimensionality of 3 already achieved an F1 score of 77%. With that standalone analysis at hand, we wanted to answer what is the best combination of features. As an excessive evaluation of every possible combination is not feasible, we used the small heuristic here. This uses the best combination in a feature forward selection strategy. At first, the best scalar feature is used. We already know this will be the active power from the slide before. Afterwards, this feature is tested with every possible combination of this feature with another scalar feature. And of course, the best combination chosen then. But what about multidimensional features? The heuristic will also test if there is a multidimensional feature or a combination of them that actually outperforms the combination of the scalar feature used. For example, for a dimensionality of 3, it is checked if the tri-stimulus, which has a dimensionality of 3, outperforms 3 scalar features. If so, the tri-stimulus is chosen. And we evaluated this up to a maximum dimensionality of 80 for each dataset and 3 classifiers. You can see here that bumping the dimensions up to around 5 or 10 already leads high of 1 scores of over 95%. But you can also see that increasing the dimensionality at some point actually hurts performance. And this is due to the curse of dimensionality. We actually saw a sweet spot here at around 25. This spot gives pretty decent results by having only a rather small dimensionality of 25. And the selected features for this sweet spot are active power, phase angle, tri-stimulus and waveform approximation leading to an average of one score of up to 98%. We also tested this against using all features. And indeed, as you can see, it actually outperforms all 27 features that have a total dimensionality of 128 using just these four features listed here. Lastly, let's answer which classifier to choose. And we can actually do so by looking at the same results from before. You can see that throughout every dataset, the random forest classifier performs best. But we want to further emphasize that an already pretty simple KNN classifiers achieve scores of up to 94%. Since KNN can actually be optimized to be computationally and memory efficient using further tricks, we argue that KNN is of choice for systems that have only very few computational resources. If, however, more resources are available, random forest should be of choice, as it delivers a 4% gain in classification score. So let's summarize what we have seen for non-intrusive float monitoring on resource-constrained systems. We have seen that some features alone already show decent classification scores, like active power or waveform approximation, for instance. However, these results can massively be improved using a combination of features. And we found that this set here, encompassing active power, phase angle, waveform approximation and tri-stimulus with just 24 dimension, gives almost perfect results, which you can also, also see from this confusion matrix on the right here. And lastly, we identified random forest as the best classifier and k-nearest neighbor as the best classifier if every single computation matters. Thank you for your attention.